Hello and welcome to our video summarising everything you need to know about the Songs of Ourselves Volume 1 Part 2 Anthology. My name is Barbara and this is the ninth of a 15 part video series where we examine all 15 poems in this anthology. Do make sure that you come back for video number 10 because every day we will release a video examining each of the poems in detail. So let's carry on with the next poem in this collection which is Ode on Melancholy by John Keats. Now in order to fully analyse this poem you must first understand that melancholy, in other words sadness, was viewed for the longest time as an illness. It was an imbalance, according to a lot of people, especially in Keats's time, in the body's humours, specifically an overabundance of what they called black bile that led to ill temperament, in other words depression, mood swings, anger and a brooding disposition. And this, for the discerning reader, might have very well been the categorization of the entire Romantic period. Do you remember that John Keats, who lived in the 1700s, was seen as a Romantic poet? Now, contrary to what you might think with the word Romantic, it's not to do with love. It's more to do with the association with nature and nature being seen as the highest manifestation of innocence and what everyone should aspire to and everything to do with the city as being associated with the corruption. Now, John Keats, as a junior doctor, would have most likely come into the definition and the treatment of melancholy during his training as a doctor, which is why this particular poem, Odom no Melancholy, is so interesting when it comes to his writing. Now, this was written in the spring of 1819 as part of the famous Great Odes, and it differs slightly from the others in the fact that it addresses the reader rather than an object or emotion. It's also one of the shortest of the odes, with only three stanzas of ten lines each, a total of 200 words, and it's packed with Greek mythology and imagery that Keats no doubt gleaned from his studies at Enfield, and also from his interest in the classics and classics literature. Now, this ode, whilst not amongst the most lauded or well-known of the odes, is still perhaps maybe the most uplifting and hopeful of all of Keats's odes whereas his other odes dwell on the injustice and misery of life. In Ode on Melancholy, Keats addresses the reader, a sufferer of melancholy, in other words, a sufferer of depression or maybe sadness, and tells this reader not to worry, that beauty and pain are intertwined in the world and that both offer a fuller view of life when occurring in tandem. Melancholy, which is a notoriously unbeautiful subject, has actually turned really beautiful by Keats's flowing words and his fond address. Now, it's worth pointing out that Keats originally had written this as a four-stanza poem. The first stanza was removed just before it was published, and the missing stanza is as follows as you can see beneath here. And it states, Though you should build a bark of dead men's bones, and rear a phantom gibbet for a mast, stitch creeds together for a sail with groans to fill it out, bloodstained and aghast, although your rudder be a dragon's tail, long severed, yet still hard with agony, your cordage large uprootings from the skull of bald Medusa, certes, you would fail to find the melancholy, whether she deemeth in any isle leith dull. Now, of course, this stanza was removed, and Harold Bloom stated that, should the first stanza have been published with this ode, it would have upset the delicate balance of the entire poem, which is, at its heart, an acceptance of the state of melancholy and an embrace of misery that resonates with the reader in its simplicity. Now, when it comes to analysing the poem specifically, Leith, the Greek goddess of the underworld, River of Oblivion features in another poem called Ode on a Nightingale. Now, in the first stanza, Keats lists what not to do when beset by melancholy. There's also perhaps why the earlier first stanza was rejected. By using a heavy amount of negative words, no, nor, not, Keats actually manages to drive his message further, considering that he's speaking about the idea of melancholy and bad temperament. Now, the negative grammar helps to reinforce the idea that melancholy is actually a part of life. One can't escape it by praying for oblivion or drinking wolf's bane. Also, it's not the intertwining of death within the phrase. It was well known for melancholy to cause a brooding temperament and a wish for death. However, Keats's masterful imagery within this poem and his dreamy invocations bring to the forefront the infamous dream world that's glimpsed throughout all of his work. 
In Keats's world and in Keatsian poems, the world is made up of myth and legend. This is also the case in melancholy, where imagery is made up solely of almost religious motives in Greek myth and the splash of colour, for instance, ruby grape, which helps to, ironically, bring ode on melancholy to life. Now, in the second stanza of this poem, Keats moves on from what not to do when beset by melancholy to what one can actually do. He notes the idea of melancholy suddenly appearing in detail, which he mentioned in a letter to his sister and brother as being debilitating, almost changing the world. Reading it with a modern perspective, one can clearly draw allusions to depression, the way that Keats describes the sudden fall of melancholy, the way that the imagery suffers for it and turns droop-headed flowers and hides a green hill in the April shroud, to quote from the poem. However, what becomes evident to the reader is the beauty of this imagery. Now, it's not only the beauty of Keatsian poetry, of John Keats putting to pen to paper and delivering a journey of half a myth, half pleasure. It's also the beauty inherent in melancholy, a sort of preciousness that Keats attributed to sadness as helping him appreciate life further. Although sadness has its pains, according to Keats, it actually helps one understand the scale and scope of happiness in life. In other words, what's life without a measure of sadness, so that one can accurately see how happy one is? Thus, Keats suggests enjoy the bursts of melancholy that come across, and to quote from the poem, he states, Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose, or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave, or on the wealth of globed peonies, or if they mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. Now, in the final stanza, Keats shows the importance of melancholy and shows that melancholy is entwined with so much of the higher and most beautiful forms of life. It's entwined with beauty. And to quote from the poem, beauty must die and joy, whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu. Therefore, it's impossible to have a complete life according to this poem without melancholy. It's also impossible to live with only half emotions, in other words, with only just happiness. And this sense of contradiction to mixing in the happiness with the sadness actually helps strengthen the ideas that Keats wishes to express to us as readers. And he does this through contradicting but effective imagery, such as the example of April. So for example, April is a sad and rainy month, but it's also beautiful in its own way. And it leads to the blooming of those droop-headed flowers that he mentions. A morning rose, although fleetingly alive, has a beauty that brightens during April. So that's all. If you found this summary useful, do give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. But also make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstreetutors.com. There you will find plenty of English revision model essays, but also online courses that you can help, you can use rather, to help you improve when it comes to your essay writing technique and your understanding of different topics within English. Thank you so much for listening and make sure you come back for video 10, where we look at the following poem in this anthology.